Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the second part of our fall lecture series, the four-part series. Last week, we had an excellent session um, setting the historical context of the Arab Spring. And tonight, we look forward to hearing about the Arab Spring's impact on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, I, just briefly, I'm Amy Richards, and I just started with the World Affairs Council, so I'm just stepping in for, for Dixie at the microphone tonight. Um, tonight's event is co-sponsored by the United Nations Association, USA. It's the Grand Rapids um, chapter, and the co-sponsorship for tonight is in recognition of United Nations Day. There is a brochure at the desk when, where you signed in. Um, if you didn't get one or you would like one on your way out, please feel free to, to take one away. Well, we're very pleased to have Professor Keith St. Clair with us tonight. Professor St. Clair uh, is in the Political Science Department at Grand Rapids Community College. He teaches in International Relations and Comparative Government. And his academic specialty is on the Middle East, um, which is also a place he has extensively traveled. So he's been to Israel, West Bank, Jordan, Amman, Egypt, Morocco, Turkey, and Iran. Uh, last week, I noticed quite a few people in the audience had been to Turkey. Just of those, again, the, the areas Keith has been to, Israel, West Bank, Jordan, Amman, Egypt, Morocco, Turkey, and Iran. How many of you have been to that, any one of those areas? It's usually over half the audience. It's quite amazing. Uh, excellent travelers. So um, we look forward to hearing what Professor Sinclair has to, um, to share with us about the Arab Spring's impact on Israel and Palestine. Please welcome Keith, uh, Professor Keith Sinclair. Thank you, Amy. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, again, I'd, I uh, encourage you, if you're interested, to, um, to take a brochure and perhaps join the United Nations Association. They do great work promoting the UN and the peace that it stands for. Okay, my uh, talk tonight is uh, inspired, of course, this whole lecture series, inspired by the Arab Spring, the, uh, the mass movements uh, that are overthrowing some regimes in the Arab world, uh, and what that means for democracy and what, how it's gonna affect more particularly tonight, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is uh, certainly an integral problem in that part of the world and in, of, of great interest to U.S. foreign policy. So what is, it, what is it gonna mean for peace? We'll start off tonight talking about the problem itself. Uh, some of you are probably more familiar with it than others, so we'll do uh, kind of a, a, brief, uh, a brief history here. Here you have a map of Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, uh, and the Golan Heights. Um, the area here in green and orange is what became the State of Israel when it was declared a, an independent state in 1948 by the Jews that had migrated there, many of them from, from across Europe. And, uh, and it, did, of course, didn't happen peacefully. It uh, uh, was a result of a violent struggle, both with the British occupying power and the, um, the Arab peoples that lived there. Uh, and after the conclusion of this 1948-49 war, uh, not only was there now a recognized state of Israel, but you had a large number of uh, refugees from this area that became known as the Palestinian refugees. And many of them fled to what became the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and even beyond. Uh, the yellow portion that you see on this map is the area that Israel did not conquer and so did not become the state of Israel. So the fighting, the, the border basically between the yellow areas and the green and the orange was simply where the fighting stopped. And the fighting uh, in, a, in essence was, there was no peace declared, it was basically an armistice or ceasefire. Um, and so you had the Gaza Strip basically governed from then on by Egypt, whose army had occupied it, and Jordan, whose army had occupied the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, occupied that. And they proceeded to govern over it, over it for, uh, well, up until 1967, which is another period that we have to talk about. The Golan Heights up here is not recognized as a part of Palestine, but um, 
is area also conquered in 1967 from Syria on the part of Israel. So what you have here is a map of early Israel from 1948 to 1967. And as I said, you had a vast number of, of Arabs or Palestinians fleeing the area. And, but not all of them fled. So there was certainly a, a, a portion that stayed behind. And those that did stay behind, although a, a relatively small minority, they were eventually offered citizenship of the new Israel. And them and their descendants remain citizens to this day in Israel and can vote and have all the rights of citizenship. And many of them yet consider themselves Arab and Palestinian. Um, the state of Israel likes to call them Arab Israelis. Palestine or Palestinian is not a word that the Israeli government is, is fond of. Um, and so the Israeli government calls them Arab Israelis. They may call themselves Palestinian and they may have an affinity for the Palestinian refugees uh, who are, they see as their kin elsewhere around the world. And here's an example of uh, an Arab Israeli. I believe this woman happened to be Christian. Uh, about 10% of the Arab Israelis are Christian, but the vast majority of them are Muslim. And here's a, a, a National Democratic Alliance, which is an Arab party in Israel uh, campaigning for elections. They, they do have representation in the Knesset, albeit a small one. Um, they're not likely to ever be offered a, you know, uh, a coalition in any Israeli government, so they may remain somewhat politically ineffective because of their small numbers, but uh, they are at least represented. And, and the point is, is that they have, uh, they have representation, they have the right to get elected, they're citizens, and uh, Arab Israeli citizens have the right to vote for them. So, which I think is very important, uh, because often we hear uh, that, you know, Israel as is a Jewish state. And I don't think that's completely accurate. It's, it, it's not just a Jewish state. Israel is also an Arab state, and it's also a Muslim state. In fact, almost one in five Israeli citizens to this day are not Jewish. The vast majority of them are actually Muslim. And this is something that we don't usually think about. Some of them complain about discrimination from their fellow Israeli citizens. Um, and these are some of the complaints that you hear if you talk to them. Um, they complain about the fact that only Jews are automatically allowed to qualify for citizenship uh, from abroad. If there are Jews anywhere in the world, they're allowed to emigrate to Israel. And yet uh, many of these so-called Arab Israelis who have Palestinian relatives are not automatically allowed citizenship of Israel, and so they see that as discriminatory. Jewish communities tend to receive more state funding. You often hear that amongst Arab Israelis in Israel to this day. Uh, you, talk, you hear talk of them being discriminated in hiring or uh, in promotion and employment in certain jobs. And uh, being a minority, I guess this isn't a surprise. I mean, certainly you can go anywhere in the world and I, you show me a minority and I'll show you a group of people who are discriminated against by the majority population. We certainly have that even in the United States. Minorities are discriminated against. Uh, so we can relate to that, but it doesn't make it right. Excuse me. Arabs are not allowed to live or um, move to the pre-1948 villages that many had, have them had been living in. Um, after the 1948-49 war, many of them were removed from these villages and, uh, um, and the land taken from them, and, they, and those were some of the grievances that the Arab Israelis still have, that they're not allowed to go back to that land that they were on. There's also no non-Jewish state symbols, uh, um, such as in the national anthem or e even in the flag, uh, which has the Jewish Star of David on it. And so, again, they feel marginalized, feel alienated in a land, and yet a land that they are citizens. This shows you a, a breakdown of, uh, of some of the, um, uh, well, specifically I picked it because the Arab-Israeli population is represented. And you can see that it is a growing population, and that it is approximately 20% or one in five Israelis one in five Israeli citizens, not Jewish, in fact Arab, 
most of them, in fact, Muslim. And one in five is a staggering proportion. I mean, um, in the United States, I often hear people say that we are a Christian uh, country, and uh, I, I myself bristle at that uh, suggestion, and I, I think a lot of non-Christians in the United States bristle at that suggestion. And uh, that's, not a, that's not something I would go around saying, and, uh, and yet the proportion of Christians in this country is, is, is much greater. Um, and so for an Israeli to walk around and say that this is a Jewish state is very marginalizing and alienating to one-fifth of the population. Uh, so if I wouldn't say that here, that the United States is a Christian country, I certainly, if I were Israeli, would not be walking around saying this is a Jewish state, very, very marginalizing indeed. Of course, this is East Jerusalem. Many of you said you have traveled. I'm sure if you've been to Israel, this is a, was a highlight of your, of your tour. Uh, this is a specific part of East Jerusalem known as the, the Temple Mount and the Old City. And you can see the Old City Wall here. And this is what is referred to as the Temple Mount, meaning the, the mount on which uh, the Temple of Solomon had been built, uh, the Jewish temple where the sacrifices were made to, to Yahweh. And of course, it was destroyed for the last time uh, when the Romans destroyed it in the 1970, um, or excuse me, in the, in the 70 AD rebellion uh, almost 2,000 years ago. And uh, it has yet to be rebuilt. And yet, some Israelis hope one day that it will be. And uh, that is very unfortunate and problematic indeed, because what you have here presently is the Dome of the Rock which is a Muslim shrine uh, commemorating the fact that Muhammad ascended to heaven from this very spot, uh, a spot rather inconveniently chosen, I think, but nevertheless. <laughs> and then there is a mosque that also commemorates that, and that makes this uh, you know, one of the three holiest sites for, for Islam as well. So it's a holy site for, for Judaism, it's a holy site for uh, Islam, which came out of the Jewish uh, Christian tradition, and uh, we know that uh, further in the, in the back here, you have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is important to Christians because in the old city, that is where uh, Jesus Christ was said to be crucified. So Jerusalem being of immense importance to three great world religions and uh, certainly complicating the, the prospects for peace and in, in this area of the world. Now this area, as I'm referring to it, uh, was actually in East Jerusalem uh, when Israel was declared a state in 1948, meaning this area was governed by Jordan. In fact, in fact the front line uh, came down just to the, well, I believe, actually it was this part over here. This is West Jerusalem. And this was the part that the Jews had liberated for themselves and uh, who, which they hoped to be the, the capital of Israel when they declared it an independent state. Now the city is united, and it's united because of the 1967 war in which Israel's conquests surpassed even their own hopes and expectations. Not only did they get all of East Jerusalem, including the sought after um, uh, old city, and the Temple Mount, but they also got what became known as the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the Sinai Peninsula. So uh, in, in what's sometimes referred to as the Six Day War. And what many Israeli Jews consider to be almost a miracle. Uh, the conquest was so extensive, the victory so great. And yet because of that victory, we have a lot of the problems that we have today. This is the Wailing Wall, um, or the Western Wall of the Temple Mount. It is merely the retaining wall of what was the Temple Mount. The Temple was not here, the Temple was actually up here, but God's presence was meant, uh, expected to be, to be there, to be the Divine Presence, to be strongest at this site. And so Jews today will frequently come to this wall and not only lament the destruction of their Temple, but also pray to the Divine Presence that they believe to be behind the wall. And here you see uh, some of that praying going on. And it is segregated. Women have to pray on this side of um, this fence. 
This is, the, again, the Dome of the Rock Shrine, which is on the top. It is the oldest structure, I believe, architecturally in Islam, uh, going back to the seventh century, uh, sh built shortly after um, Muhammad's death, or at least within the century. And it, it is a stunningly beautiful monument. And um, of course, many Muslims fear that if the Jewish temple is to be rebuilt, it will have to be over on this spot, the spot that Solomon built the ancient temple, the spot that Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son uh, on the, the very rock inside this, thus the name Dome of the Rock. And if this temple were to be reconstructed, the shrine would have to go. And that would be very provocative to the world's Muslims. So here we have, uh, again, the map. And I told you about the 1948 independence of Israel and what the border looked like. And you can see that now, you know, well, in 1967, Israel's uh, success in battle gave them the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, uh, the, the Sinai Peninsula, which is here, and uh, the Golan Heights from what was then Syria. And uh, Israel was the one that attacked, although Israel claimed that uh, an Arab attack was imminent and therefore they were justified in attacking first. Uh, certainly states like Egypt under Gamal Nasser was doing some very provocative things, in hindsight very stupid things. Uh, for example, he did evacuate uh, the UN peacekeeping force that was in Egypt. Uh, the, U the UN peacekeepers were not allowed on the Israeli side of the border. Uh, he, re he, of course, moved his military into the Sinai to redefend it. The Jews saw that as a jumping off point for, possible, for a possible invasion. And, of, and he also blockaded the port of Eilat down in the south. So the Israelis took that to mean that an attack was coming. It's kind of in retrospect or in hindsight, it's kind of hard to believe that an attack was coming considering how badly the Egyptians and the other Arab states fared uh, within six days being annihilated. Their uh, air force destroyed on the ground. Uh, the ground uh, battle uh, completely uh, victorious for the Israelis. And so the West Bank was taken from Jordan, the Gaza Strip uh, from Egypt, and the Golan Heights from Syria. Now, since that time, Egypt, or I should say Jordan, no longer lays claim to the West Bank. Uh, they have renounced their claims on that territory, which suits the Palestinians fine. Uh, Egypt uh, is willing to give up the Gaza Strip uh, for the possibility of there being a, what is a Palestinian state, ostensibly a Palestinian state made up of the West Bank, the Gaza Strip. Not the Golan Heights, because that's not Palestinian land. Uh, that's claimed by Syria. The Sinai Peninsula was finally given back to Egypt um, in the, in the peace agreement um, uh, in the late 1970s, of which uh, the Camp David Accords negotiated, uh, or mediated, I should say, by President Jimmy Carter. So since that time, you have uh, the Israelis occupying the West Bank, the Gaza Strip. And as an occupying power, they are uh, uh, not necessarily embraced by the Palestinian people who live there, although uh, they do uh, at least respect uh, the Israeli soldiers that are present, are pictured here in this photo. Um, and they at least value their presence over the Israeli settlers. Um, because although they've had their run-ins with Israeli soldiers, uh, the Israeli soldiers at least have a very predictable behavior and that the uh, um, rules of engagement are, are pretty well understood. Um, the ones that the Palestinians fear the most are the Israeli settlers, the Israeli uh, settlers who have moved in to the West Bank and who are allowed to carry weapons. And if there's no Israeli soldier around, many Palestinians fear for their lives uh, from these heavily armed Israeli settlers. This is a refugee camp in the West Bank, as I believe the Aida. Uh, uh, refugee camp. Here you have the symbolism of a keyhole, uh, the symbol of a key, and on the key it's written, not for sale. And uh, many Palestinians uh, who fled their land in 1948 
And by the way, because they fled, they were never allowed to return by the Israeli government. It was only the Palestinians that stayed behind that didn't leave their land that were ever eventually offered Israeli citizenship. And so their cousins, their relatives who fled were never allowed to come back. And many of them who fled their homes retained the keys to their homes. And uh, in, in some ways adopting a, a, a symbolism that many of the Sephardic Jews had from Spain. When they fled Spain, many of them took their keys with them and retained that symbolism of their homes for generations. And so you have, uh, in some ironic way, the Palestinians becoming uh, the new Jews, the people without a home, without a state, and yet who commemorate their, their, their homes with the very keys. The United Nations, uh, we're celebrating uh, this week the United Nations uh, founding, and uh, um, the United Nations certainly has played a role uh, in trying to maintain the peace, not only throughout the world, but also here, albeit less successfully. Uh, the United Nations presence is still there in, um, in Jerusalem, even though uh, there is no border there to really uh, observe any ceasefire, but their contingent is still there. The UN Relief's Work Agency assists the Palestinian refugees, and this one in this particular uh, refugee camp. And it's important to note that the United States is a major funder. We are the most important funder of not only the United Nations in general, uh, but also the UN Relief Works Agency, which assists the Palestinians. So much of the aid that the UN distributes to the Palestinians coming basically from the United States itself. This is a settlement uh, in the West Bank. And um, this one, I believe, is called Har Homa. It's just north of uh, Bethlehem. And you can see that it, it looks like a fortress. And although uh, it's residential, uh, the high ground is not, um, it is certainly tactical um, to make it easier to defend the community from abroad. You can certainly see a distance against any enemy that would be approaching. Uh, so it is a very tactical in its construction, uh, and, uh, and, and I guess rightly so from the Israeli settler's point of view, because there, there certainly is the threat of the Palestinians nearby. This is the infamous uh, security barrier that Israel has been constructing, and a guard tower. Now, it's been constructed in the West Bank to separate the Israeli settlers from the Palestinian population uh, and has, uh, from the Israeli point of view, in fact, reduced the likelihood of suicide bombs and that sort of thing. Um, from the Palestinian point of view, it serves a, basically a dual role. Not only is it there to keep the Israeli settlers protected from the Palestinians, but it also, from a Palestinian point of view, is seen as a way to uh, seize more land, more Palestinian land, because of the way that it is actually built. It is not, by the way, a wall everywhere in the West Bank. In fact, in many places, it is really just a um, razor wire. Um, only in certain portions is it actually a physical wall. Here you have some palace, or excuse me, some Israeli settlers um, jogging. Um, uh, this happens to be in Hebron, and uh, you can. What's noteworthy here to me, as they were jogging past, is their assault rifles that they carry with them. Um, the Palestinians are not allowed to have those assault um, uh, weapons in, in Hebron, but the Israeli settlers are. And uh, it is rather intimidating to see someone uh, walking around in a very cavalier way, way um, with an automatic weapon. I found that rather disconcerting myself. Um, and, uh, and certainly if I was a Palestinian, I, I, could, I would even be more so. I mean, certainly Palestinians have told me that on occasion, Israeli settlers have pointed these weapons at them when there was no soldier around. And many of these Palestinians have said they never knew if the settler was going to open fire or not. And if he did, who would know? You know, it would be his word against the Israeli. In the West Bank, uh, not, there are certain segregated roads. Uh, on some roads, both Israeli and Palestinian vehicles are allowed to travel. Uh, the, the, the license plate here denotes that this is a West Bank or Palestinian vehicle, and uh, the yellow one designating that this one is an Israeli vehicle can go into Israel. 
And here they're allowed to travel on the same road, but in some cases only Palestinian vehicles, and in other cases uh, a road network specifically for the Israeli settlers. So the, the segregation uh, uh, or uh, apartheid from a Palestinian point of view is, is, is very complete in how far it extends in everyday life. And yet uh, there's an irony in that uh, many of these Israeli settlements, although loathed by the Palestinians themselves, uh, many of the Palestinians, for lack of work, had found themselves working in building the Israeli settlements. Uh, and then the, Israeli, or the Palestinian workers receiving the money and using that money to build their own uh, illegal constructions. So uh, both sides rapidly trying to fill up the vacant areas of the West Bank to increase their uh, so-called facts on the ground and claim to the land. In some areas of the West Bank since the 1990s, I remind you the 1990s were a very optimistic period. Peace talks were convening between the two sides. It looked very promising. Um, uh, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, before he was assassinated, uh, uh, had seemed to find some rapprochement with uh, Yasser Arafat. Uh, his, his ancient rival, and they were, they were making progress towards uh, uh, a solution. And they, the Israeli government under Rabin had granted the, um, the uh, Palestinians autonomy, local autonomy, in certain areas of the West Bank, where they could have their own police force, that, where they could run their own affairs. Um, you know, these were, this was known as Area A. Um, and then you had Area B, where the Palestinians had less control, and then Area C, which was a lot of area that, uh, where there were mostly Israeli settlers, the Palestinians had no control. So depending on, as a Palestinian, where you lived in the West Bank, you had uh, more or less uh, representative local government anyway, even though you didn't have any state sovereignty. And so this was a very prominent, promising period. This happens to be in the town of Bethlehem, and you can see that here, at least, the Palestinians are allowed to have a police force. At least in this town, Bethlehem being a Palestinian town, um, the Palestinian police are able to carry weapons. In Area C in the West Bank, the Palestinian police would not be able to even carry, not even have a uniform, let alone carry weapons. Bethlehem, by the way, uh, used to be predominantly a Christian Palestinian town, and it's only been until recently that that's changed. Uh, it's now predominantly a Muslim Palestinian town because most of the Christians have left. Uh, Christian Palestinians tend to emigrate out of there uh, primarily because they can. Uh, they have contacts with Christian churches in Europe and the United States, and it's much easier for them to emigrate than some of uh, the Muslim Palestinians. Unfortunately, that's declining the Christian population of this area. Here you have a map of showing you the extent of the Israeli settlements in red. Uh, and it's, it is pervasive throughout the West Bank. And a lot of the sites for these settlements uh, are, are very strategic. Uh, many of them placed along the, the Jordanian border, uh, for example. Many of them placed strategically around Jerusalem with the the intent of them eventually, that land being eventually annexed by Jerusalem, making Jerusalem an even more important city, and uh, a city that is now united under Israeli control and, uh, and thereby annexed by the State of Israel. It's important to note, though, that because, uh, because of the West Bank and East Jerusalem are not recognized by the United States as being a part of Israel, we don't believe, the United States does not recognize the land taken by Israel in 1967 as a part of Israel. Therefore, our embassy remains in Tel Aviv on the coastline of the Mediterranean, not in Jerusalem, where the Israelis would have it. We instead have a consulate in Jerusalem. But because of the touchiness of that, uh, we have refrained from placing our embassy in Jerusalem and instead have it in Tel Aviv. Uh, so all of this land from the United States policy, foreign policy, is, is to be negotiated uh, with the Palestinians with the expectation that there be a Palestinian state. I think many Americans forget that as well. The Israelis do not consider this, they wouldn't call it occupied land, they call it the disputed territories, uh, a little bit more politically correct from their point of view. 
The UN Security Council Resolution of 1967, which was passed, uh, and the United States did not veto it, but in fact endorsed it, uh, basically gives uh, its recommendation for how a solution to this war should be uh, ended, and that is a negotiated peace where land is, like Israel gives up much of the land that they acquired in return for peace. And it is a complete violation of this UN Security Council resolution for Israel to continue to build settlements in the West Bank and even in East Jerusalem, which is exactly what they've been doing. So Israel has been flaunting this um, UN Security Council resolution uh, for a very long period of time. And even though the United States endorsed this resolution, we have continued to veto attempts to actually uh, bring heart, uh, uh, sanctions to enforce it. Uh, since this time, we've become very protective of the state of Israel. Now, you often hear the, uh, you know, the idea of a two-state solution versus a one-state solution, and I, I just want to clarify what is actually meant by that. A one-state solution would, in essence, be letting all the Palestinians in the occupied territories, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, letting them become citizens of Israel and just having one state, right, with everybody citizens of it. That is not an idea that the state of Israel is keen on. So by default, what we tend to talk about is what's called the two-state solution. And the two-state solution is the idea of creating an independent state of Palestine in at least portions of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, right next to and adjacent to the state of Israel. So in the end, there would effect be two states. This chart shows you why the Israelis are not keen on the one state solution. This shows you kind of a demographic breakdown in millions of people. And here you have, in the state of Israel, about 5.4 million Jews that are citizens of Israel. In the rest of the world, there's only 7.5 million Jews, and of those, most of them are in the United States, 5.2 million Jews. Of the Palestinians, 1.4 million of them are citizens of Israel. As I said, descendants of the 1948 war who didn't flee their land uh, and are called by Israel Arab Israelis. They might refer to themselves as Palestinian. That's not a name that the Israeli government likes to use. But nevertheless, 1.4 million Palestinians, citizens of Israel to this day. Like I said, almost a fifth of the population. In the West Bank, you have another 2.4 million Palestinians, and in the Gaza Strip, uh, 1.4 million. The rest of the world, refugees, 4 million, uh, uh, most of them in Jordan, 1.8 million, and in other Arab states, 1.5 million. But if you simply look at Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, and add this up, you roughly get uh, 5 million people. So, if Israel were, if we were to go with a one-state solution where all of these Palestinians in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and what already exists in Israel were allowed citizenship of Israel together, you would have the Jewish population only about half. Not an acceptable solution by, considered by an Israeli government that insists on calling itself a Jewish state. As you can imagine, they would scarcely be a Jewish state if Jews were barely 50% of the population. And so that's why that one state solution is not likely, nor is it acceptable to the current Israeli government. Although I'll point out that 25% of the Palestinians polled in the West Bank would, pref would actually accept that uh, citizenship of Israel if it was on offer. So, the two-state solution then, uh, what progress towards that? Well, probably the closest we've come to peace between the two sides, Palestine, the Palestinians and the Israelis, was in the year 2000, the closing days of Bill Clinton's administration. And President Bill Clinton playing a very active role in mediating the struggle between the two. 
and uh, trying to sponsor peace talks at, uh, um, at Camp David. And Ehud Barak was the Prime Minister of Israel at that time, and in many ways very progressive in what he actually offered, even though he didn't formally uh, want to offer it. In other words, he floated the best offer that the Palestinians had ever been offered, and Yasser Arafat uh, could not bring himself to accept it. Bill Clinton was very critical of Yasser Arafat's failing, failure to accept it, although uh, I'm a little bit more understanding of why Arafat might have felt that he couldn't take it. Uh, first of all, Arafat was not willing to end the discussions. Uh, it was an offer that was made in the form of an ultimatum, take it or leave it. There were no questions allowed. There was no counterproposal accepted. It was either this or nothing. And so Arafat ended up feeling that he had to choose nothing. But what was it? Uh, basically, the offer was the Palestinians would 80% of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip that they could call a Palestinian state. The Israelis would re have the, remain, the remaining 20%, mostly of uh, the Israeli settlements. Um, the Israelis would have sovereignty over the Temple Mount, and the Palestinians would have to give up the right of their refugees ever to return to the 1948 borders of Israel. Yasser Arafat, uh, like I said, could not bring himself to accept that. And by the way, uh, Ehud Barak, it was a rather interesting diplomatic nuance with regards to how that proposal w was made. Basically, Ehud Barak wanted Clinton to be the one to offer it. In other words, it was an offer that was only on, it was only an offer if the Palestinians accepted it. Because Ehud Barak didn't want to own it. So uh, if they didn't accept it, it wasn't an, it wasn't on offer just so uh, he wouldn't have to f pay a political price amongst his own uh, Israeli uh, constituency. A price that he ended up paying probably anyway because he was quickly voted out of office afterwards. Well, as negative and as disconcerting as, the, uh, as what little progress has been made since, uh, all is not without hope. Uh, I am, I, I force myself to be optimistic about this. Uh, and I, this is my silver lining on, in what has really been a, a very negative 10 years for these two uh, sides. But what I want to point out here is that progress has been made sometimes even despite um, uh, um, what the Israeli government might, uh, might have. For example, a, Prime Minister Ehud Barak floated the idea of swapping territory and sharing Jerusalem, the most progressive idea up until that time. Ariel Sharon, uh, not much liked by the Palestinians, but be became prime minister and successor to Ehud Barak. But even he did something that in some ways was progressive by evicting, he evicted all the Israeli settlers from the Gaza Strip and actually even removed some of them from some West Bank uh, uh, settlements. Now, those Israeli settlers did not go willingly, and it was quite, uh, quite the scene to see these Israeli settlers being dragged from their homes. But uh, in essence, that's what happened. They, in essence, went kicking and screaming. But Ariel Sharon, uh, certainly a hawk when it came to the Palestinians and the Arabs, was still willing to at least pull the Israeli settlers out of there because from his point of view, the Gaza Strip wasn't desired Israeli land anyway. So why not pull them out and then basically wall it off? And uh, um, uh, from the Palestinians' point of view, they, they then found themselves surrounded in the Gaza Strip. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert followed him. And he agreed that Palestine should have the equivalent of the 1967 borders, even if it wasn't the exact same borders. In other words, what he was willing to do, which was very progressive, is actually give, give the, uh, the Palestinians an equivalent amount of land in exchange for the settlements becoming part of Israel. So that even though uh, it wouldn't be exactly the 1967 borders, the amount of land the Palestinians would end up with, as far as a state of their own, would be the equivalent amount of land. Now, the Palestinians, uh, you know, found this very uh, promising, but um, even if the Israeli land on offer was desert, it was still principle of the thing. It was an equivalent amount of land. So uh, uh, 
you know, face could be saved in some ways. But um, unfortunately, Ehud Olmert made this in the closing. You know, it wasn't an offer that he could politically give, but it was a, st a policy statement that he actually made publicly, knowing that he was on the way out. And we now get uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And unfortunately, I have nothing positive or progressive to add to this list on the part of Benjamin Netanyahu um, yet. But like I said, uh, sometimes we find circumstances arise and progress is made. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. Even uh, sometimes progress is made even in spite of the, the participants. So what does an eventual solution to look like? Well, certainly the Camp David talks in 2000 were a good start, but we've seen that um, that wasn't acceptable to the Arafat. And the reason it wasn't acceptable was because he didn't feel that he could give up the Temple Mount. He didn't feel that he could give up uh, the Palestinians in principle right to return to their historic land. After all, he saw Yitzhak Rabin assassinated by a Jewish radical for what Yitzhak Rabin had offered to the Palestinians in the 1990s. I think Arafat had to, I don't think that message was lost on Arafat that he could be assassinated by his own people if he get, was seen to cave in on something that was so central to Palestinian desires, the Temple Mount itself. So, but in the closing days of the Clinton administration, there were other possibilities, other talks made about how they might share the Temple Mount. Uh, perhaps the Temple Mount could be given to an international body that could oversee uh, both the is Muslims' right to visit it and both the Jews' right to visit it. Uh, Clinton talk, President Clinton talked about how the uh, Palestinians could have the right to the top with the Dome of the Rock Shrine and the Israelis could have the right to everything underneath, which is the archaeological digs that they've been hoping, a kind of, uh, uh, kind of a Solomon kind of type of solution, I suppose, splitting the baby. Um, well, the expected solution, should it occur, will look something like this. Basically, the Palestinians will get a state. It will roughly be along the borders of the 1967, even if they're not exact borders. Uh, the Palestinians will be offered the right of return if most of them decline to accept it. <laughs> right? In other words, a token amount of Palestinians will be allowed to come back to 1948 Israel, perhaps 1,000, maybe 2,000 tops. Uh, this, the Israeli uh, state feels that they could accept and not be threatened demographically within their own borders. But most of the Palestinians will then have to to give up that and decline the right. I mean, the, the right will be extended. In other words, the gift will be offered only if the gift is refused. And in this way, both sides can save face. Uh, that will be fine for many Palestinians, but not all Palestinians. Certainly the ones from 19, the 1948 refugees are in effect gonna be sold out uh, and they're not gonna be happy with it. But um, if that's to be, that is probably what's gonna have to happen. Well, there are, uh, that's, that's just pointed out that the 1948 refugees would be in effect sold out, even though the 1967 refugees would probably be happy with the 1967 borders. Uh, this brings us to some other complications, and that is the, the, the Palestinian Authority uh, in, the, in the West Bank uh, is currently run by one pr particular party, Fatah, that is the party of Yasser Arafat, who is now dead. His uh, uh, successor, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, is, uh, is the president of the Palestinians and uh, the leader of Fatah, which is a very secular political party. The other party is known as Hamas, and Hamas is a, a Muslim fundamentalist party that believes in uh, opposing Sharia law. And uh, from an international point of view, from the United States' chagrin, uh, it was Hamas that actually won the 2006 elections within the Palestinian areas. Now, I believe Hamas won that election, not because most Palestinians want um, to live under Sharia law, but in fact, because Fatah, with Yasser Arafat gone, has been perceived as a party to be very corrupt by the Palestinian people. 
And I believe that it was as much a vote against Fatah as it was a vote for Hamas. Nevertheless, the Hamas government that was formed uh, was quickly undermined by the United States and many of the Western powers. And the United States encouraged Fatah to basically seize power back, which they consequently did, at least in the West Bank. So in the West Bank, Fatah currently runs the local politics in, in the West Bank, where Hamas has taken power in Gaza. And so uh, now you've got a very difficult situation, and w some have speculated maybe we need to talk about a three-state solution, uh, which is problematic. So Hamas controlling the Gaza Strip now, and w the West Bank controlled by Fatah the secular Palestinian party of Mahmoud Abbas. Now, um, when Egypt was ruled by Mubarak, uh, Mubarak had cooperated with the Israelis in blockading the Gaza Strip because Hamas was no friend to Mubarak because they were affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, an opposition movement in Egypt itself. So that is uh, where the Arab Spring has definitely complicated situations for Israel's ability to keep Hamas in its box. Now, in Mahmoud Abbas's uh, um, uh, corner, he has actually tried to get some traction, most recently, because the peace talks have been going nowhere with the Israelis, by moving or proposing uh, to the UN that the Palestine be recognized as a state, even if the Israelis won't recognize it. And he has floated this idea in the UN Security Council, again, embarrassing the United States, to the point uh, that President Barack Obama, although sympathetic to the idea of a Palestinian state, said that he would, in fact, veto it. Uh, the, the confusion, if you are confused by that stance, uh, this is the reason for it. The United States is in favor of the idea of a Palestinian state, but only if Israel recognizes it. And so even though in principle we'd like to see a Palestinian state, according to U.S. foreign policy, we don't want to see the Palestinians unilaterally declare one and have it recognized. We want only if the state of Israel recognizes it first. So the United States has the possibility of using its veto in the UN Security Council of nixing this proposal. And uh, uh, it is currently in committee. It has been officially proposed. And uh, we're not sure how it will, if it will come to a vote soon. We're trying to talk the Palestinians out of withdrawing it. Uh, it has been, the idea has been floated that the Palestinians should instead try to achieve, uh, at least by the Europeans, uh, this offer, that they accept, uh, non, or they, they accept a state observer mission to the uh, United Nations. In other words, they could have, they could be called a state, but at the same time they wouldn't be accepted as members of the UN and therefore they wouldn't have a vote in the UN. Now the uh, Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinians has said this, idea stinks, uh, and he's not happy about that at all, but basically that is something that we've tried to offer them. Right now the Palestinians are a non-state observer of the UN, meaning they send a delegation to the UN, they can take part in talks, but they have no vote whatsoever. This, this proposal for them would really not do anything other than give them the title of a state without any of the real practical benefits of a state, uh, but it might be something it was it's hoped that maybe Mahmoud Abbas would accept this and thereby withdraw the motion and avoid the United States' embarrassment of having to veto it, of which there will no doubt be uh, a worldwide backlash. Well, it's, uh, in the meantime, you've probably read that Hamas is uh, experiencing the success that uh, Fatah has not been able to have. Uh, Fatah has been frustrated on all counts. It has seen this UN uh, proposal threatened to be vetoed by the United States, and it's left uh, Mahmoud Abbas scrambling and hoping for some sort of what looks like a victory, because in the meantime, this week, Hamas has had the victory of uh, releasing their Israeli prisoner, Galid Shalik, and in exchange for 1,000 Palestinian prisoners held by the Israelis, about half of them Hamas and about half of them Fatah. Uh, this is being greeted with jubilation amongst the Palestinian people. Uh, this is only going to fuel the popularity of Hamas. 
Uh, I'm frustrated with the Israeli uh, governments, although I feel for the uh, Galij's family. I certainly glad that he's o you know, okay and going to be released. But on the other hand, the political uh, ramifications of this I don't think are good, at least from the United States' point of view. It's only going to embolden Hamas and drive up U Hamas popularity and at the same time marginalize our favorite, Mahmoud Abbas and the Fatah movement. Okay, well that's with the United Nations and certainly I wanted to touch on that considering that uh, this week's celebrating the United Nations uh, um, itself. Um, but in addition to that, what does the larger ramifications of this Arab Spring mean for everything that I've already explained? As you can see, it's complicated and the Arab Spring complicates it even further. Most notably with states that are directly on Israel's border. Starting first with Egypt. Egypt had made peace with Israel back uh, in, uh, was it 1979, um, with the Camp David Accords. They, the Israelis gave back the Sinai Peninsula that they had taken in the war in return for Egypt recognizing the state of Israel to exist, exchanging ambassadors, and signing a peace agreement with them. Ever since that time, uh, um, and by the way, Anwar Sadat was assassinated by his own people because of that, uh, but his successor, Mubarak, since that time, has developed a relatively close relationship with the state of Israel. And uh, because Mubarak, the dictator that he was, feared the opposition within his own country, the Muslim Brotherhood, Muslim fundamentalist movement, that, uh, whose violence has waxed and waned over the years. Well, it's Ham Hamas is kind of a, a, a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood in that they also want uh, Sharia law, Muslim law imposed, and a state uh, for Palestine. And so um, Mubarak did work with the Israeli government in boxing in Hamas in the Gaza Strip, blockading it. And, uh, and I, you know, with, I don't know, varying degrees of success. Certainly you read about Turkey's attempt, or not Turkey's government, but some Turkish citizens' attempt to run that blockade with the flotilla that they sailed and Israel forcibly boarded it, resulting in the uh, unfortunate deaths of those people who were, the Turks who were on that uh, ship. And that has certainly soured relations with Turkey. And <laughs> the problem there is that Turkey and Egypt had been, in some ways, the closest governments to Israel in this region for the last 20 years. Turkey had been an ally of Israel, even doing, uh, uh, performing joint military uh, operations and exercises with the Israelis and uh, and now that we have a Muslim fundamentalist government in Turkey, the AK party, and with these recent deaths of Turkish citizens on this flotilla, flotilla that was attempting to run the blockade of Gaza, uh, relations between Israel and Turkey have soured uh, and uh, the animosity has probably never been greater uh, in, in my in my lifetime. And uh, uh, this is unfortunate. This is further alienating Israel. Israel, you know, uh, you know, may have had the tactical success of boarding the flotilla, but the it was a strategic disaster in that it has alienated further its one-time ally, Turkey, and has also, well, for in effect, led to the end of the blockade uh, because of the political ramifications around the world. The Egyptians fe under felt under pressure from their own people to lift the blockade on the Gaza Strip. And now that Mubarak is gone, uh, and Egypt is now facing a government that feels pressured by majority will, and the majority of Egyptians being very sympathetic with the Palestinians, it's unlikely that Israel is going to have the partner that they had with Mubarak. And Israel can't be happy with that at all. Certainly not Benjamin Netanyahu. In Jordan, um, the Jordanian king, Abdullah, has yet to be overthrown, but things are not looking good for him. Uh, he rules over a state that is made up of what are called indigenous Jordanians, but also about half the population, Palestinian refugees. And Jordan, unlike many Arab states, did more than any other Arab state for Palestinian refugees. They actually offered the Palestinians uh, in their land citizenship. So although these Palestinians are citizens of Jordan, 
uh, many of them still feel discriminated against by the indigenous Jordanians, of which the royal family uh, is one. And, uh, and, the, and the King Abdullah is not necessarily popular amongst these Palestinians, even though he has attempted to appease them by marrying uh, a very beautiful Palestinian woman. <laughs> Uh, and is, makes every point to remind people of that fact in order to bring his people together. Um, but he even, it seems in recent weeks, he's even alienated those indigenous Jordanians that, uh, uh, um, uh, that he has traditionally looked to as his reinforcements. So uh, the protest that he's experiencing is, is very precarious. Uh, for him, and of course the United States relies on him as a very valuable ally, and so has and so has Israel, because of the two Arab countries that have made peace with Israel, Egypt being one, Jordan was the other. And so uh, if he goes, then that, what does that say about the future of that relationship as well? Uh, Israel is certainly concerned about it. In Syria, uh, Bashar Assad, the dictator there, certainly under um, uh, perhaps even more pressure. The, the protests have been massive in Syria. Uh, he has responded brutally, ruthlessly, uh, killing many of his own people. We've read about this in the paper. Um, the threats on our own ambassador's life have resulted in the our Barack Obama withdrawing our ambassador from Syria this week, at least temporarily. Uh, yet we still haven't f formally broken relations with Syria. Uh, it's, uh, Bashar Assad cannot look on what happened with Gaddafi with, uh, uh, you know, relish, and, and he must fear that his fate may end up being the same. Now, it's unlikely, and certainly NATO has discouraged any involvement in Syria as they did in Libya um, because of what they feel that they can practically accomplish. And frankly, for their part, the opposition in Syria has requested that foreigners stay out as well. So we're not, the invitation isn't forthcoming, perhaps as it was amongst the Libyan rebels uh, in that state. So, you know, Bashar Assad was a dictator, and although he had not recognized the state of Israel and he had not made peace with Israel, there had reached an understanding, at least. Uh, and in, in the early uh, years, well, around 2004, 2005, it looked like they were very close to closing a deal over the Golan Heights under um, uh, Prime Minister Ehud Omer. George Walker Bush, as President of the United States, discouraged such a deal. He encouraged uh, Prime Minister Ehud Omer to hold out for a more comprehensive peace that he hoped would be established once uh, the success in Iraq was realized. Uh, the success in Iraq took much longer than he anticipated. Um, and perhaps an opportunity was lost there. Um, but the point is, is that Israel has found it a little, the, the behavior of dictators to be a little bit uh, more predictable than um, uh, the now burgeoning democracy in some of these uh, lands like Egypt. I mean, um, nobody really knows what the Egyptian democracy will look like um, and what type of government and the relations with Israel. Mubarak was very predictable. Uh, the Israelis must miss that. Same with Assad. Uh, he was their enemy, yes, but an enemy that was very uh, predictable uh, in many ways, and that they had, they had learned how to deal with him. Uh, what would follow Assad is something that the Israelis can't easily predict, and therefore uh, the Israeli government must look on with tre trepidation. So, in sum, uh, I'm not sure what this is going to mean for the future, However, given the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and how it was stalled and the peace talks were going nowhere, and the fact that democracy is something that I support, no matter what country it's in, um, I cannot think, I am certainly hopeful that the changes that we're seeing in the Middle East are in the long run going to be for the better. And that it will, I hope that it will put pressure on the Israeli government to take peace talks a little bit more seriously. Um, I certainly don't want to see Israeli security jeopardized, but at the same time, uh, I do would like, I would like to see a Palestinian state, and I, would, I know that the state of Israel is necessary to bring that about, 
as long as the United States is going to veto any unilateral attempt for a Palestinian state. <coughs> Iraq is certainly pictured on this map, and uh, uh, I know that President George Walker Bush had much hopes when he invaded Iraq and that the, uh, you know, the neocon belief that establishing a democracy in the Arab world would, would spread uh, like dominoes. And uh, there are certainly some who think that this is, uh, so in some way, the invasion of Iraq was maybe responsible for what we're seeing uh, around the, the Arab world. And, and I am not of that uh, mindset. I believe, uh, in fact, the opposite. I believe if there was anything about the struggle in Iraq for the United States, it was, it was the, the uh, resistance of the Arab people, their ability to fight uh, U.S. forces to basically a standstill. Uh, that was probably more inspiring to what people can do on a grassroots level to the Arab world, in the Arab world. Um, you know, we only really f had the breakthrough success in Iraq. You know, we talk about the surge. The surge is almost implying that it was the increase in troops that really did it for us. But it wasn't that. Uh, what really did it for us is the, the change in tactics, the change in policy. You know, we ended up making peace with the very people that we were fighting, the Sunni insurgents. You know. uh, the analogy, if you can't beat them, join them, worked perfectly, right? We decided that instead of fighting these Sunnis, uh, we told them, we sat down with them, we said, we'll stop attacking you, we'll even give you weapons, and we'll even fund you if you stop shooting at our troops and turning in, in instead, the Al-Qaeda types. And the Sunni, the Sunni forces, the Sunni rebels in Iraq jumped at that. They said, sure, you got it. You give us the weapons, you give us the money, we'll give you the Al-Qaeda. And so the deal was reached and things quieted down. But it wasn't just the surge in troops, as many would actually have you believe, that brought that, um, um, that, brought that about. And so I think that uh, uh, I don't give the invasion of Iraq a lot of credit here. And uh, if anything, uh, I think what the, the Arabs in Egypt have emulated are more the likes of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, this is what's stunning to me. I mean, I thought when the revolution came that it would be immediately violent. Um, and Egypt by far is the most important and the most populous Arab country in the region. And I predicted that it was going to be a revolution that would follow the death of Mubarak. I never dreamed that the revolution would occur before his death. And nor did I ever imagine that it, how it would happen. That it would happen through mass peaceful protest and civil disobedience, like the civil rights struggle in the United States with Martin Luther King. Uh, using the technology of social networks like Facebook to coordinate, to organize, and that the Egyptian military would refuse to fire on its own people. Um, to me, what has occurred in Egypt is nothing less than stunning. And I am so proud of the Egyptians and what they were able to accomplish and how they have flaunted the stereotype amongst many Americans that all Arabs and all Muslims are inherently violent and they could never adopt uh, the peaceful protest and tactics of a Martin Luther King. And what we've seen this last winter has completely proved those Americans wrong. Now, there has been some violence, and I'm certainly worried about this new democracy and whether or not uh, um, um, they can develop the constitutional restraints to rein in the majority will. You know, the, uh, the democracy is just that. It's majority rule. And we, it's, in my mind, it is a double-edged sword uh, because the majority can be very tyrannical as well. Um, the ma a majority can deprive you of your liberty just as easily as any dictator, if not more so. And if you're a minority, uh, a majority can be very fearsome. Uh, you know, it can result in the extermination of minorities. We've seen this throughout history. And so my real fear is not that majority will won't happen 
for Egypt. I think it clearly has. But my real fear is will uh, they develop the liberal constitutional constraints to protect minority rights? I think there's also an, another myth uh, amongst uh, American neocons, at least who saw democracy as taking a foothold in the Middle East, because I think they're getting it in one, in one way, but not with the, uh, perhaps the conclusions that they anticipated. Um, in Iraq, for example, it, say Iraq does become a, uh, a strong democracy, or even Egypt. When President George Walker Bush invaded Iraq, I think he believed that a democratic Iraq would be uh, an ally of both the United States and Israel, and that uh, a democratic Iraq would never want nuclear weapons. Right? But I think that is completely uh, illogical. Right? A democratic Iraq, or for that matter, a democratic Egypt, is going to have affinity for their fellow Muslims amongst the Palestinians, not the Israelis. I don't see how automatically a democratic Iraq and Egypt becomes automatically an ally of Israel. On the contrary, I would, I would expect that there might even be greater hostility. And likewise, I believe that a democracy, especially one of the importance of Egypt's size and population, and Iraq's as well, may indeed want nuclear weapons. I mean, after all, the United States is democracy. And uh, as a democracy, I don't see us willing to give up our nuclear weapons. In fact, we seem insistent on having them. Why would not a democracy in this region of the world? And how is Israel going to react uh, when a democracy demands the right to have nuclear weapons? Um, of course, that's a question I can't exactly answer. But let's turn it over to you. You've been very patient, and I certainly appreciate your your patience, uh, but I would like you to uh, ask me what, 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 what would you like me to address? Uh, there's microphones, I believe, on either side here, and I'll be happy to entertain those questions. working there. Um, I want to thank you for presenting your point of view. Um, I'll, I'll say at the outset that, first of all, I'm a member of the Jewish community here, and I've also lived in Israel. I've been a citizen. I am a citizen as well, although I was born in the U.S., and I've served in the military there, so I, I understand the situation in Israel. Um, and I felt like, first of all, the presentation was a very one-sided presentation presenting a lot of facts, but certainly representing, no doubt, what Palestinians feel, and this, it's certainly legitimate, right? The feelings that they have and many of the positions. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it becomes a bit of a half-truth when the other side is treated as if it's illegitimate or incorrect. And I saw that throughout the presentation in terms of the slides, you know, whether it's the UN 242 resolution and how Israel violated, and then silence, right? It's Israel violated. Mm -hmm. Or we talk about, you talk about uh, the Christians leaving Bethlehem because they're emigrating, because they can, not perhaps because of persecution that they're suffering as well, not just at the hand of the Israelis. Um, so I, I've been there recently, the last few months, so this, these are current events as well as mm -hmm. my own past. But the thing that perhaps stuns me the most is your talk about the Arab Spring in Egypt. And Although I understand what you're saying in terms of the um, uh, this democratic movement and this, you know, this uh, the, the the popular reaction, which was certainly legitimate. I had friends on Facebook in Egypt that I was talking to, uh, and I watched them uh, tell me afterwards our revolution is being hijacked, and I had warned them. I said, "This this is a political thing. It's, this is not just a movement of the people," and many military an or analysts of the time which I don't hear from you, and I, I want to get your uh, opinion on this. Many military analysts, uh, analysts at the time said, the military is in control in Egypt. Um, uh, Mubarak is a son of the military. He came from the military. And his intent was to give the reins of power over to his son. 
who is not from the military, and the military was not going to accept that. And they were waiting for the opportunity to overthrow him. And so when these people came along very conveniently, after the Tunisian event where the uprising came, and of course due to terrible economic conditions both in Egypt and in Tunisia, people had these protested, and of course they did not fire because they were looking for that opportunity to change governments and be involved in that as, as a controller. So yes, the, the, the Facebook and Twitter revolution was powerful, but it was more of a catalyst than the cause. And even today, the military controls this. So I, I just wasn't hearing that in terms of what's underneath a lot of what we're seeing uh, in Egypt today. OK, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I admit I, I am biased in this uh, conflict. And uh, I, I did not try to hide my bias. Uh, and so I, I hope that that was, uh, that was fair and up, up front. Uh, I, I, my bias is in favor of a Palestinian state. My, my bias is in favor of the two-state solution. Uh, my bias is in favor of a, a border uh, roughly along the 1967 borders. Um, my bias is in favor of uh, a joint or international uh, um, oversight of the Temple Mount. Um, that's my bias. And, uh, and I do believe that the, uh, the major obstacle has been coming from the Israeli government side. That's also my bias as of late. As far as your um, question about Egypt, um, if what you say is true, uh, and it, it could be, uh, I, I don't think so. I hope not. Uh, but if it is, then the Israeli government will probably be very pleased. Uh, because again, if, if it is going to return to military rule and a military dictatorship, then Israel, will, Israel, the state of Israel, will have a very predictable partner uh, at, uh, akin to what they've had over the last 30, 40 years. Um, if I'm right, uh, it will be very frustrating for Israel indeed because uh, a government that res respects the majority will in Egypt will, will be somewhat, will be unpredictable from an Israeli point of view and therefore more threatening. And, uh, and yet, I would prefer that option uh, because I prefer democracy. And I think that the Egyptians have proved uh, whether you think that they're the reason for why Mubarak stepped down or not, they've proved through their mass movement, they're willing to sacrifice their lives in a peaceful way, that they deserve the chance uh, that a democracy will provide them with. And is the Muslim Brotherhood going to play a role in this democracy? Absolutely. They are Muslim fundamentalists, and there are many Muslim fundamentalists in Egypt. But I caution you to avoid stereotyping all Muslim fundamentalists, uh, or Christian fundamentalists, or Jewish fundamentalists for that matter, as all extremists. Uh, uh, most Muslim fundamentalists, like Christian fundamentalists I know, have never killed anybody, and never would. Uh, I think, unfortunately, many Americans have the stereotype when we hear the word Muslim fundamentalist, we think terrorist. Um, that's not true. And we shouldn't automatically attempt to exclude all Muslim fundamentalists from a, a full functioning uh, democracy. So I would argue the Muslim Brotherhood has, uh, uh, has earned the right to participate, to run for office, to hold elections, I hope that they don't hijack those elections, but uh, I, I'm well aware of what can happen in a fledgling democracy. But I think Egypt has earned our right to give them that chance, and, uh, and they should have to prove us otherwise. Very interesting talk, thank you. Uh, I was, I'm trouble with what a Palestinian state would look like, especially after seeing your map with all the settlements dotted all over uh, that area now. It would be like Swiss cheese unless, yes. unless there would be some, lots of holes in the Swiss cheese. But how, how could it ever be a workable thing? 
the Israeli settlements are the greatest threat to a two-state solution. Um, the more Israeli settlements that are built in the West Bank, the more, pr the more trouble there is in actually making a, a Palestinian state that could even be uh, uh, contiguous, let alone sustainable. Uh, Israeli settlements in these occupied territories are a clear violation of the UN Security Council resolution. They are the greatest threat to peace and probably my greatest argument for why Israel is, the, is uh, being provocative in, in the current peace talks by continuing to build them. They are the greatest threat to a peaceful solution to the, in, in this situation. And I do fault the Israelis. That's another one of my biases. Uh, I fault them for those Israeli settlements. Oh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Um, but, uh, how, she's asked how many Israeli settlers there are. I, I seem to remember 200, 250,000? I want to say that. I'd have to go back and check. What's your opinion on the role of Iraq and Saudi Arabia in these events? Well, I think Iraq is preoccupied I'm with. Sorry, I meant Iran. Oh, Iran, yeah, now there's a player. Uh, <laughs> Iran. Uh, but uh, Iran, you know, Iran, when I was there, I was amazed. I, when I traveled to Iran in 2009 following the, the 2009 presidential elections, the elections that were considered widely to be fraudulent, where President Ahmadinejad was proclaimed the winner. Uh, despite the fact that most Iranians didn't believe it, um, and, and they took to the streets in mass movements, and, and using the same social networks to organize. And, uh, and so Iran is, in many ways, has been dealing with uh, what has occurred in this Arab Spring, uh, even before the Arab Spring occurred. And, uh, and the people of Iran, uh, there couldn't be a greater disconnect between the government of Iran under Ahmadinejad and um, the Ayatollah Khamenei, who is really running the country, um, and who has found, uh, and who has endorsed the results of those elections, um, there could be a greater disconnect between them and the people. I mean, the people, when I was there, um, uh, the, the, I couldn't believe the love that I experienced as an American. And rarely do I walk around the world, you know, proclaiming that I'm an American, and then even when I do, uh, seldom am I greeted with hugs and kisses and on the uh, by the people on the streets, by complete strangers. And that's exactly the situation I experienced in Iran. Uh, people so apologetic, uh, saying that their president is an idiot and, uh, and that they were so sorry about that and how, how much they admired America and how much they idealized uh, what we stood for. In many ways, I think this love was very surreal. It was kind of a puppy love. I don't know if it was a real love. but. You know, I think they, they love the idea of America and, the, you know, their distorted view of what America is. I, I don't know if they really knew us, if they'd really love us so much. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it was amazing. Uh, I had never experienced any, any of that in any European or any other allied country, not even in Israel, was, I mean, uh, did I experience that. So it was amazing. And I, I think that President Ahmadinejad's hold on power is also precarious. So even though he has benefited uh, from, ironically, the policies of George Walker Bush. And this was more than once pointed out to me in Iran, because I asked them, I said, what did you think of President George Walker Bush, expecting the worst, because so often he was vilified throughout the world. And uh, you know, the Iranians were all right with him. They said, you know, he's not a bad guy. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily like him that much, but he wasn't that bad. Uh, because, why? Because he took out their two greatest enemies, uh, Saddam Hussein of Iraq and the Taliban in Afghanistan. The Taliban being Sunni, most Iranians being Shiite, and many uh, Sunni extremists like the Taliban consider Shiites apostates, heretics, blasphemers. And so uh, now that we have taken them out, of course, the Iranians would love to have the United States now leave. But in many ways, they were thankful to George Walker Bush for what he did by taking out their enemies and making them, by default, a regional power. 
it is no doubt, uh, given Iraq's current weakness, that Iran will dominate uh, and, be, and, and having the Shiite uh, uh, connection with many of the Iraqi citizens, its influence will be pervasive for the near future. So Iran has definitely become a regional power. The other thing I, I, I got from the Iranians, um, although they were embarrassed by their president, they did think he was an idiot, and they do think the election was fraudulent, and they wish that they could re, uh, remedy that. Uh, but even the Iranians I talked to who loved America said that they should have the right to have nuclear weapons. And who are we to tell them not, that they can't? After all, Pakistan has nuclear weapons, which they don't really get along with. Israel has nuclear weapons. Um, and again, that told me that uh, a democratic Iran is probably still going to want nuclear weapons. Um, now, I don't think it was a priority for most people. I think they think their president's being needlessly provocative by even having a nuclear program. But they felt that they should have the right if they want to. Um, I also don't predict that they will be allied with Israel should they become a democracy either. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia and Iran are kind of the two adversaries in this region. Uh, the, Saudi Arabia being predominantly a Sunni country, but with a Shiite minority that's also oppressed. And Iran is very uh, um, empathetic towards Shiite minorities wherever they're oppressed. And they usually are because seldom are Shiites the majority. <laughs> Uh, there's only a couple countries in the world where Shiites are the majority. One of them is Iran, that's the most important. Uh, the other is Bahrain, and that's an island in the Persian Gulf. And the other, um, Azerbaijan, which one am I forgetting? Iran, uh, Azerbaijan, oh, in Iraq. <laughs> I almost forgot. <laughs> Iraq, Shiites are majority in Iraq. So those are very few countries in the world where Shiites are actually the majority, but those are the exceptions. Yes. Funny story. I felt you were biased towards the Israelis, um, and I am not a Muslim. <laughs> um, I'm also not Jewish. Um, my question is that um, if you envision a two-state solution with uh, Palestinians having a land of their own, what role um, do you see water playing um, in that negotiation? Well, unfortunately, water is another complicating factor because, uh, you know, it's a very arid portion of the world. Um, the Dead Sea is very salty. You can't really drink that. Um, and if you tasted it, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the Sea of Galilee is fresh water, and it, it, uh, the Jordan River flows down from it into the Dead Sea. Um, and certainly, this is uh, strategic from the Israeli point of view. And the Israelis. Uh, control the headwaters up here. Uh, now that they've taken the Golan Heights, they completely control around the Sea of Galilee. And uh, with that, they've been able to siphon off a lot of the water from the Jordan River before it even reaches the Dead Sea and using it for irrigation of crops and, and the like. Uh, this is a, a bone of contention in the whole region for other uh, countries that r rely on that water. Then, of course, you have an underground w aquifer which is basically parallel to the borders of the West Bank. So basically, the West Bank has a, an enormous aquifer under it uh, where you can dig for water. And that's another reason for why the West Bank is sought out after, not only by the State of Israel, because many see it as the Holy Land uh, of, uh, of the ancient times, of the King of David and King Solomon, but also because of uh, uh, it, it allowing for um, access to water for the Israeli government, and also because of its, the Israeli government's e more easily uh, defensible border uh, with Jordan and the like, much easier defensible than this border was. And so yes, so unfortunately, water is a complicating factor. But uh, to me, the most important sticking point is the Jerusalem and the settlements. I just wondered why the Israeli government allows the building of the settlements to go on if it's in violation of a um, national security resolution and the rest of the world is very critical of this. Why are they turning a blind eye or refusing to, to curtail that? 
in your opinion? Well, because many of these settlers vote. And, uh, you know, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition government, uh, the right-wing Likud party, uh, depends on the votes of a lot of uh, Israelis who want these settlements, who want portions of the West Bank, and feel it's important that Israel have a claim to this. And so, uh, in order to keep his coalition together, I'm sure there's an incentive there. Now, there might, he might also personally feel that uh, that should be Israeli territory, but even if that isn't true, his, many of his constituents do, and so the government of Israel has, as you say, turned a blind eye to a lot of these constructions. Now, every now and then, they do destroy, they do bulldoze one. Uh, they're far more likely to bulldoze a, um, a Palestinian house that's illegally built, but they have been known to bulldoze some uh, um, uh, uh, Israeli settlements uh, that perhaps have been a little too provocative, or maybe to just uh, show a token resistance to this sort of thing. But the Israeli settlements uh, are then quickly go back to rebuilding them. Um, and so it hasn't been uh, an even, um, an even um, um, treatment on the Palestinians' illegal c construction and these settlements' uh, is illegal construction. Do you have an axe to grind, in other words? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have an axe to grind. I mean, no, I've, I've just studied it, and this has been my impartial uh, opinion. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm, if you want to know my background, I was raised Roman Catholic. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm no longer a practicing Catholic. Um, I'm, I, I'm an atheist now. Um, and so uh, I, I'm fascinated by religion. Uh, I love studying about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, I th and Buddhism, and Hinduism, and all that. And I think many of the world's faiths have, uh, there's, there's something profound in all of them, I think. Uh, however, not enough that's profound that allows me to embrace any one of them. Uh, but there is a lot that I admire about Judaism. Uh, um, I, 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 I love the, uh, you know, in the Jewish tradition, the encouragement of argument amongst the, uh, the religious. I mean, that's something I, I find somewhat lacking in Christianity. There's not enough argument within Christian churches where uh, in Judaism that's almost encouraged uh, uh, to study and to discuss and to argue over interpretation of the Torah. And uh, I, I think that Jews have been oppressed throughout history. And, uh, and so it's somewhat ironic that they now find themselves in a position where they can be the oppressor. Um, and certainly I think that Jews have been oppressed even in this country. And I recognize the important role that they played in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, uh, marching with the likes of Martin Luther King, fighting for another minority who they equally saw as oppressed. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to uh, the plight of, of Jews throughout history. But I am not a Zionist, and I, I, I object to the idea of Israel as being a Jewish state when one out of five uh, Israeli citizens are not Jewish. Uh, thank you, Professor St. Clair, for your interesting talk. I wish that I can see some people like you in some of TV channels, like starting by Fox News, for example. Uh, <laughs> First of all, my name is Ahmed. I'm a Tunisian graduate student in Grand Valley State University. Yeah, we are the guys who are starting the Arab Spring. Uh, so I would thank you for your academic accuracy. And actually, I didn't feel any bias in your uh, talk. You both provided both sides. And you... Well, that uh, might be the kiss of death right there. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you mentioned a lot of threats to the peace talks basically the extremist part of Hamas, and I definitely agree. For me, for example, my own concern is, uh, you know, Jews, they, they, they deserve a state, they deserve to be secure, 
Jews uh, live in Tunisia for seven, 1,700 years now. They live in peace and they have the right. We consider them Tunisians like us. Uh, but what concerns me is the extreme actions taken sometimes by the Israeli government. So I would like to add a threat to the peace talks, which is the wars that occur from time to time, like the war on Gaza a couple of years ago. That's a threat for the peace talk, you know. Uh, obviously, s Israel has the right to secure itself, but when you start your war by bombarding United Nations complex or supposedly there are terrorists over there, that's a big question. And we can mention here the Goldstone Report. You know about the Goldstone Report, right? Goldstone, Goldstone Report, yes. Yeah, Goldstone Report about its UN mission to investigate the whole thing over there, and it get objected by many countries, starting by France, starting by uh, Italy, starting by England and the United States. Uh, you How can you do that with a flotilla? No, no, the Goldstone Report before the flotilla. Okay. It's UN mission, mission to investigate the war on Gaza that happened in 2009, b last right. December, January. So, and they found that there are a lot of uh, violation of international laws. Uh, anyways, um, your presentation gave me polarized feeling. The first part is kind of sadness because you didn't mention Tunisia. Uh, and the thing, and the and the other part, it's extreme happiness because you didn't mention Tunisia, so we are away from conflict, you know, and that's a big relief. <laughs> so it's like because obviously we have a lot of things to care about. Uh, you know, I can understand that it's away from in the Middle East, it's in North Africa, uh, but basically we have a dictator. So among the things that the country that westerns the Arab Spring are not the same. And Tunisians, from the very beginning, we said, guys, we made the revolution, but we didn't aim to export it like we export olive oil. You know, that's not a product to take and test it in your country. But if you, you want to go for it, go for it. That's it, as simple as that. So you said Israel uh, used to deal with uh, dictators. Because simply, dictators uh, go, you know, stay on duty for a long time, so they can so they can uh, predict them. Uh, even, for example, Mom Gaddafi, uh, in that recent event, said, this guy is unpredictable, but we can predict one thing, that he's going to be crazy. And exactly, he, went, he, he just went very crazy. So uh, the dictators are predictable because they are military and they say for a long time. So, this is, so what, I, what I can see that this new challenge for Israel government if they're going to deal for, with government that's going to stay uh, for a temporary period, like four years and then shift back, that's another challenge. You know, this is why most of the dictators or most of the Arab countries, they have challenge to deal with Israel because in each couple of years there is a new dictator, there is a new tendency, there is, even though they're going along the same, you know, but as we can see, there is difference between Ehud Olmert and Ehud Barak, and there is different be difference be between the uh, opinions of can I caution you that we are short on time, so if oh you yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, get sorry. to the question. Uh, okay, so uh, for this new for this new democracy, for example, starting by Tunisia, what do you think that do, do you think that it's kind of impossible to make a peace talk? Do you think that it's really unfortunate that three religions happen to be in the same spot, or it's a message from God that you guys can live together? What do you think? Well, I don't think there is a God. I think I already established that. Uh, and so, yeah, it's unfortunate that three great religions would find the same piece of land valuable. Um, and yeah, I do think that complicates uh, the peace. I am, f uh, I may be biased, but I'm forever hopeful that this, this, there is a solution. It's not like there isn't a solution, and even most Israelis recognize that the solution I laid out is, the, is what will come to pass. It's just a matter of getting uh, the governments in question to, to recognize it on both sides. And of course, the Palestinians have their own uh, complications. The fact that they're not united is, is an incredible difficulty, that they're divided between Hamas and Fatah. That doesn't help. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do think that there is hope. I mean, in 2002, all the Arab countries in the Arab League offered, including Saddam Hussein, Israel peace if they would go back to the 1967 borders. Uh, that was not an offer that was accepted at the time by the Israeli government. That same offer was made again in 2007. Uh, again, 
the Israeli government felt that they could not accept it given the current situation uh, and the threat to their existence. So it's, but I find the offer very promising. So uh, I haven't lost hope. I didn't mention Tunisia because it didn't border Israel and I was a little short on time, so I'm sorry about that. But I felt Egypt and Jordan and Syria were more important to, to, uh, to mention. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I guess I'm right that we're out of time. Is that right, Kathy? So I, I do want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we have two other presentations, mine being the last of the series on November 8th. I hope to see some of you again. And I can certainly linger if you have any other questions you'd like to ask me. But thank you for coming.